Good morning. I hope all of you are doing well today. And before we get started today, I just want to wish all the moms out there a happy Mother's Day. I know it's going to be an unusual Mother's Day, but uh, I know it'll be a good day for you and your families. And uh, just want to pass that along to you. Just have a good Mother's Day today. We're going to continue our study today about holy vocabulary. We've looked at these three words, holy, and in that it was God is distinct from and above absolutely everything else. Then we looked at the word lost. Without Christ, we are hopelessly lost. Then lastly, we looked at this word, salvation. And Jesus made it possible for us to be righteous before God. Righteous before God. And today we're going to look at the word faith. Faith. You know, when we talk about faith, most of the time we associate that with re religion. But uh, you know that the idea of faith goes beyond religious expression. And really it's a part of our everyday life. For example, we experience a form of faith when we go, we have to go somewhere and we go to get in our automobile and we take it on faith that it's going to start, everything's going to work, and it's going to take us to where we want to go. And you know, I was thinking about this. This morning, when you went into uh, your kitchen or your dining room to have breakfast at the table and you pulled out a chair and then you just sat down in that chair, you know, that takes faith that that chair is going to hold you up. And so we do a lot of things that take faith. It's not just, it is part of our religious vocabulary. But really, it's something that we experience every day. And uh, we take a lot of things on by faith. But you know, unfortunately, a lot of times our faith is misplaced. We have faith in a person. But that person does something that causes us to lose that faith in them. They don't meet our expectations or they, they fail to perform as we believe they should. But you know, there's one that we can always depend on who never fails. And when we confidently place our faith in God and we realize that we can believe and trust Him, today we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Just to give you a little background on the book of Hebrews, it was originally addressed to an audience of uh, Jewish Christians. They had confessed Jesus as the Messiah, but because of persecution they were beginning to go through, they were considering maybe a return to the Jewish religion. We don't know when the book was written, there's a lot of speculation about who, 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 had, uh, who wrote the book. But here's some things that we find in that book. The first thing we see is the superiority of Christ is the main theme of the book. And after the writer gives kind of a prologue in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1, then he shows how Christ is superior to Angels, Moses and Joshua, the old priesthood, the old covenant, sacrifices, and how uh, uh, the uh, new sacrificial system was brought in. And then, in about chapters 10, through 19, the writer gives us some practical things about these truths that he, he talked about. 
So chapter 11, you know, we call that the Hall of Faith. The Hall of Faith because it lists names of people uh, in Scripture who lived a life of faith. And then we realize also in chapter 12 where it talks about a great cloud of witnesses and that uh, cloud of witnesses are those people who uh, the writer talks about in chapter 11. And today we're going to look at a couple of examples that should give us some uh, encouragement about faith, about our faith. And we're going to look at three outcomes of faith that should give us some confidence and some encouragement to trust God to do what He says He will do. The first is this. Faith leads us to believe and rely on God. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. You know, it says this, now faith is, and when we, we see that, we think, well, this is a definition <coughs> of faith. But really what the writer is intending here is not to give us a definition of faith. He's really not describing faith. Uh, well, he's not defining faith, but he is describing faith. And his focus here is on the life of faith. The life of faith. And he tells us what genuine faith looks like. Genuine faith looks like. Let's look at verse 1. Now. Now. And we see that word now. You know, really there was no chapter verses in the original text here. So what he's talking about here now, you go back up and read uh, the last couple of verses or three verses of chapter 10. For yet in a little while the coming one will come and not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith, and if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. But we are not those who draw back and destroy, but those who have faith and are saved. Now. Now. And then, he gives us two Descriptive statements about faith. Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for. King James says it this way, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The NIV says faith is the confidence of things hoped for. Now, those words, reality, substance, confidence. If you take the King James substance, it means to stand under, to support. It talks about it's like the foundation of a building. Or it's like a, a, a contract in a business transaction. You're taking that contract to support whatever the transaction is. And it's like a, a personal commitment. It's like a personal uh, promise. Now faith is the support. It's the foundation. It's a personal commitment of what is hoped for. In other words, this hoping for it is not uh, our usual use of that word hope. It's uh, something, you know, we hope, I hope I'll get to do this, or I hope I'll get to go there. But this hope is assurance that it's going to come to pass. 
Faith is the reality of what is hoped for. What is going to come to pass. It is really going to happen. It's the reality. It's really going to happen. So biblical faith has nothing to do with wishful thinking. Wishful thinking. Hope. This is confident hope. It's reality. And what we hope for, it's really going to happen. Really going to happen. And then it, it says faith. Faith is real or genuine because we believe it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And this hoping for, we have the faith, we have the hope, and what we have hoped for by faith is going to happen. It's going to happen. And so the next thing we see is, it says this. Now faith is reality of what is hoped for. The proof of what is not seen. The evidence, King James says, of things not seen. ESV says the conviction of things not seen. In other words, this faith is... Uh, you know, things we cannot see, but we believe, but we have faith that they do exist. I've never seen God, but I know that He exists. Why? Faith. I have that confidence. Faith. I've never seen God. I've never seen any angels. But I have faith that they really do exist. One writer said this, spiritual truth cannot be proven by physical evidence, but faith provides full assurance and conviction. Things I can't see, but I have faith that they do exist. And it's what, you know, I believe and I have the assurance and conviction that what God said is true and it's reliable. So, faith. Reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. And then it, we see that faith is practical and beneficial. Look what the next verse says. For by it, faith, our ancestors won God's approval. Now the King James uses the word elders. The New American Standard says men of old. The NIV says ancients. Faith, for by it, our ancestors, our elders, men of old, won God's approval. Obtained a good report. Earned a good reputation. Approval. A good report, a good reputation. In other words, when we look at their lives and we look at what they said, we believe because we have faith enough to know that they had God's approval. What they said and what they did was God's approval. But, you know, we know this, that uh, we don't gain favor from God on the basis of our performance. They didn't either, but 
they gained His approval. Why? Because they had faith in Him. They believed that He would do what He had, would, had said He would do. But then before He begins to list those people of faith, he gives us something that uh, the faithful of the past uh, believed in. And there was something they all had in common. And it was this. They all believed that God is the Creator. They all believed that God is the Creator. They all believed that God was the beginning of everything. He created everything. Was there anyone present when God created? No. Only God. So no one can give real personal testimony to you know they, of the creation. And you know today uh, we have the theories about creation, don't we? About what happened at creation. Now I don't know how you were taught in school, but when I had science class, they said the scientific method is this. And one of the first things was this, observation. Were there any scientists present to observe the creation? No. So how can they say this is a scientific theory when there was no one there to observe? And that's one of the principles of the scientific method. One writer said this, we must not be intimidated by all the scientists with their numerous degrees and the power of the media to propagate their theories. And we see this beginning over and over and over and over, don't we? See, but scientists cannot explain the who and they cannot explain the why of creation. Look what that verse says. By faith, we understand that the universe by faith we understand perceive with the mind by faith that the universe the worlds now that's what King James said and uh, that's talking about uh, uh, time and ages. It, you know, we say there's the we have the world of insects, we have the world of this, we have the world of that. Well, all those worlds, the world, the universe, was created by God, and these other worlds, the insect world, the animal world, you know, whatever. They were all created by God. And we understand that, not because we were there to see it, but by faith. By faith. The universe was created. He took everything and He put it all together. It was created. How was it created? How did God create? What does it say? By the Word of God. What does Genesis say? It says God spoke. And this happened. And that happened. God spoke. So the worlds, it was created by the Word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not yet visible. God made all things 
He put them all in their proper order. And we can see the moon, the stars, the oceans. We can see the animals, the plants. You know, we can see those things. But how were they created? How do we understand that God created them? By faith. By faith we have to believe that God does what He says He will do. We, one writer said this, faith understands that behind everything visible is the invisible command of God. Faith in God's revelation is a way of grasping reality without necessarily comprehending all the steps that may be involved. You know, it's like we're talking about that car. When I go out to my car and by faith I believe that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. I didn't see the guys that put that together you know, at the car plan. I don't know how those parts of that car go together to make the engine run and put it in gear and all those things. All that's invisible to me. But by faith, I believe that the car will do what it's supposed to do. Get me from one place to the other. So God is the focus of our faith. You know, it's the strength of our faith. He's the strength of our faith. You know, our faith doesn't come from emotions, our feelings, our knowledge. Why? Because those things are subject to change. Subject to change. So what is the first outcome of faith? Faith leads us to believe and rely on God. Faith leads us to believe and rely on God. Here's the second outcome. Faith responds with worship of God. Faith responds with worship of God. So we're going to, we're going to look at a couple examples of people in this hall of faith. These are men and women that the writer uh, commends for having faith. And it's important to remember that every event listed, the writer says that it was by faith. It by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Now, He's not talking about saving faith. We know what that is, saving faith. When we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus to be our Savior and Lord, saving faith. But once I have that saving faith, I am to live my life by faith, by faith, by faith. See, this chapter in Hebrews that we call the Hall of Faith it's not about becoming a believer, but it's about living that life of faith. And what that does, it, it demonstrates the genuineness of their claim to be believers. Right? The first one listed in the Hall of Faith is Abel. And how many of you can tell me who Abel was? Well, here's who he was. He was the second born of Adam and Eve. The first born, of course, was Cain. Was Cain.
And this is what it says about Abel. By faith. Now remember we're not talking about saving faith. We're talking about by a life of faith. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. King James says a more excellent, the New Living says, more acceptable sacrifice than Cain did. Now if you want to read about Abel's story, that's found in Genesis chapter 4, verses 2 through 5, about the sacrifice that they were making. It tells us in verse 2 of that chapter that Cain offered some of the land's produce. He was a farmer. Abel offered some of the firstborn <coughs> of his flock and their fat portions. He was a herdsman. Now the, the thing that happened was there, Cain just gave the Lord some of what he had. Abel gave the Lord the best he had the firstborn. Cain just gave something of what he had. Abel gave the best he had. Think about that. Do we give God just some of what we have? Or do we give Him the best of what we have? And that's not just talking about in money. That's talking about our lives. Do we just give Him some? Or do we give Him the best? Best of what we have. It said, Cain, Abel gave the firstborn. Why was Abel's sacrifice better and more excellent and more acceptable than Cain's? Yes, he gave the best, but you know why his sacrifice was more, it was better and more excellent and acceptable? Because he gave it by faith. He gave it by faith. He gave his sacrifice by faith. So you know what that tells me? Why God rejected Cain's sacrifice? was because His was not offered with faith. By faith. You know what He was doing? He was just going through the motions. This was just a formality to Him. And, and I think about that a, a lot of times in my own life. How many times am I just going through the motions? How many times are you just going through the motions? You know, it, and we talk a, a, a lot here about how that, uh, uh, you know, Brother Scott says this all the time, I just couldn't wait to get down here to be with you. <laughs> right? But see, sometimes we just go through the motions. Cain said, well, I've got to take this down there to the church or to the altar and give it or do it. But by faith, Abel offered a more or a better sacrifice. So, see, God's more concerned about our attitude of, the, of worship than He is with the type of offerings that we give. Look how John in 1 John 3, 12, what he says characterizes these two men. We must not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what was righteous. Righteous. 
That's where the New Living Translation says it. See, Cain, Abel worshipped God with the right spirit. Cain didn't. But Abel's sacrifice was brought to God by faith. By faith. Look what it says. By faith, Abel was approved as a righteous man what does that mean? It means he was in a right relationship with God. Why was he in that right relationship with God? Because God approved His gifts. God approved His gifts. That's why he was in a right relationship with God. It wasn't because really of the gift that he brought or gifts he brought. It was because he came with the right attitude. He came to worship by faith. By faith. And Abel was the very first man to be a testimony to a life of faith. He had some other first too. He was the first human being to ever die. He was the first human being ever Murdered. Ever murdered. Look what it says. And even though he is dead, how did he die? We read it in the verse. His brother Cain killed him. He still speaks through his faith. Faith. So his faith, it still speaks today. It's a witness to all of us. Even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. God approved His gift, and even though He is dead, He still speaks through His faith. One act of, this one act of faith by Abel was a testimony to His faith. It was a witness to His faith. Oh, and by the way, you know, we've talked about those words before. Witness and testimony, they come from a word that means martyr. So, if you think about it, Abel was also the first one martyred. He was the first martyr for his faith. Why did Cain kill him? Because he was jealous of and he hated he hated him because of his relationship with God. Why are people martyred today? Because they witness, they're a witness of their faith. Because we still have people who go the way of Cain. They can't stand and like Cain here, they even hate people of faith. The Christian faith.
And so faith leads us to worship. This is what Abel was doing. His faith led him to worship God. And that's what it should do for us. We live a life of faith and that life of faith should lead us to worship God. Oh, I have faith, but I don't have time to worship God. No, no. If you have genuine faith, a life of faith, it should lead you to worship God. So as we think about Abel today, and we, I hope that we'll begin to make His story, our story, that we worship by faith, that we give by faith, that we live lives of faith. Do you know what it says in Romans 1.17? It says this, it says this in other places in Scripture. The righteous will live by faith. And it says that Abel was a righteous man. Why? He lived by faith. By faith. So faith leads us to believe and rely on God. Faith responds with worship to God. And here's the third reason or the outcome of faith. Faith responds with obedience that pleases God. Faith responds with obedience that pleases God. Now this next example of faith is the life of faith is probably the most impressive of, of all of the ones listed here. And look what it says. By faith, Enoch. And if you want to read Enoch's story, you go to Genesis chapter 5, verses 19 to 24. Now, it lists the genealogy there. And Enoch was out of the line of Seth. Now, Seth was the son of Adam and Eve that was born after uh, Cain killed Abel. Seth. And, and apart from the account in Genesis, the verses here, and a verse over in the letter of Jude, these are the only times in Scripture that, that Enoch is mentioned. Is mentioned. But, you know, the one thing we remember him really far is what? Yeah, Methuselah. He was the father of Methuselah. Now, why do we remember Methuselah? You're right, because he was the oldest living man, 969 years. Enoch didn't live, but it tells us 365 years. But look what it says. Here's something else. By faith, Enoch was taken away. Now, the King James says was translated. I like that one better. Translated. That word translated means to transfer or transpond two things. One of which is put in the place of the other. To go or pass over. Now, when you see that, that he was translated, you know, growing up in the 60s, watching Star Trek on TV, right? The transporter, you know, they would get in there and wherever they wanted to go, they just told Scotty and he would take them wherever they wanted to go. That's 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 talking about. Look, because look what it says. He was taken away. He was translated. He was taken from one place to another place. Transported from one place to another place. 
And then it says this, By faith, Enoch did not experience death. Did not experience death. It's uh, you know one other person in Scripture was like this, and of course that was Elijah. But he did not experience death. You know, it's kind of hard for us to fathom how God did this, but he did not experience physical death. Here's the way one writer put it. Enoch walked with God. It tells us that. Enoch walked with God in Genesis, over Genesis. One day he walked with God so far that God just said to him, Enoch, you have come this far, so just stay at my house. And he did. It says he did not face death. He was walking with God one day. And God said, I'm just going to take you on home. There was no physical death. Now this is just me. Something that you think about. And when God took you and they began to go to heaven, God's home, heaven, that something happened to his physical body between earth and heaven. Because there is there is another scripture that says something about no flesh and blood. No, you know, that kind of body cannot enter into heaven. So something I'm I'm just saying that something happened to his body. And people began to look for him. Where is Enoch? Look what it says. He was not to be found because God took him away. God translated him. Why did this happen? Why did God take him and not someone else? Look what the verse says. For before He was taken away, He was approved by God. He was approved. King James says He had this testimony as one who pleased God. He was approved. He had this testimony as one who pleased God. It says he walked with God and he pleased God. He lived in a right relationship with God. And when God looked at Enoch's life of faith, it pleased him. It pleased him. Man, just think about that. When God looks at my life, does it please him? Does God look at your life? Does it please Him? Does He approve of it? He, he was pleased with Enoch. Enoch was in a right relationship with Him. The way he lived his life brought pleasure to God. It was faith that could be seen. People say, I have faith. Well, his faith was one that could be seen by all the people that knew him. How did they see his faith? They saw it by the way he talked. The way he talked. What's inside comes out through our mouths. You know, that's why, and this is just me, I have a lot of problems with people that say they're Christians, 
But there are some ungodly things that come out of their mouths. By the way they lived, by the way he lived. His life of faith could be seen by the way he talked, by the way he lived. He didn't say one thing on Sunday and do something else the rest of the week. He didn't live one way on Sunday and one way the rest of the week. And by the way he worked. Worked. I remember a man one time telling me that he worked, was working on a job and this man was always talking about God, always talking about being a Christian and all this and all that. But then he said this. He said, he was always talking about being a Christian and, you know, uh, God and, and, and everything. But he never did his work. So they could tell Enoch was a Christian by the way he talked, the way he lived, and the way he worked. We should be good workmen. We should do our jobs better than anyone that we work with. Now y'all know, this is what James said. This is what he said. Show me your faith without works and I will show you faith by my works. And we're thinking, Oh, James is talking about, you know, Paul and James had this controversy. Paul says, you know, it's not by works, it's by grace. James says, no, it's by works. No, that's not what that's talking about. It means that after we're saved, then there's the work. How do people know that I'm a believer? I can tell them, yes, but really I can show it to them by the way I do my job. Enoch lived a life of faith which was always pleasing to God. Live your life that way. And believe me, it, it's not something that's unique to just uh, people in the Scripture. Each of us can do that. By faith, we please God. But then look what it says. Now without faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God. Now, you might have expected uh, the writer here to say, without obedience, it's impossible to please God. Without good works, it's impossible to please God. But no, he didn't say that, does he? He says, it's impossible to please God without faith. Now, that doesn't mean obedience and good works are not important. They are. But you know what that means? Our obedience and our good works are worthless if they're not done by faith. If they're not accomplished by faith. Then the writer gives us two reasons why faith is so important. Without faith it's impossible. Since the one who draws near to God the one who walks with God. In it, it says walk with God. The one who walks with God. The one who comes to God. The one who draws near to God. Must, two things. Must believe that He exists. You can't come to God unless you believe He exists, right? How do we do that? By faith. I believe God exists by faith. 
And we have to believe this, and that He rewards. He rewards those who seek Him diligently. Who seek Him diligently. He rewards those that seek Him. That seek Him. How do we do that? By faith. And then we find that Enoch realized that he was going to receive some awards. One writer said, Our faith, our believing that He is and, and who He says He is, the gracious Lord God will move us to be, obey Him and live in ways that He approves. By faith. And how does He reward us? Listen to this. One day, like Enoch was rewarded and God took him away to be with him in heaven, guess what? If we live a life of faith, one day, Scripture says what? We're going to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. To ever be with the Lord. And what we receive that would be greater than that. So here are the three, three outcomes of faith. Leads us to believe and rely on God. Responds with worship to God. Responds with obedience that pleases God. One writer said this, by faith makes it possible to walk with God, to please God, to enjoy fellowship, and finally, to enter His glory. So what is faith? We live a life of faith that's pleasing to God. Thank you this morning. Have a blessed day.